started. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for coming. And uh, also, I apologize for my typos and the flyers, the wrong room and all that. So um, I obviously, uh, would, we need more volunteers for our group. So I'm talking about <laughs> our group, the Gender e Equity Working Group, which is um, was started when I was asked to come and speak from, uh, from the union's point of view. I'm Michelle Facto, by the way. I'm the executive director of the, of the AAUP AFT. Um, and uh, so I was asked to come and speak from the union's point of view about issues around gender equity, um, where instead of as an individual you do negotiating, you look at negotiating as a group to develop more power and um, try to pressure to get the things that we need. Um, so, uh, so I was introduced to these groups, the, co the uh, Commission on the Status of Women, the, um, the Women in Medicine and Science, and then um, Laura Lee Keishley and the work she was doing. Um, with the, the Commission on Status of Women and also with the Provost's Office. And there's a lot of people here that are very concerned about issues around that affect uh, families, which disproportionately affect women, uh, usually, not always. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we're looking at ways to make this campus a better place and to address inequities and provide more opportunity for, for everybody. Um, so, uh, so our group was formed and it's made up of uh, it's three chairs. One is from the Commission on the Status of Women. One is from um, Women in uh, Medicine and Science, which is being sued. Kim Morgan was the initial person uh, from the commission, and then and then me. And we were asked for volunteers across campus. If you're a student, or if you're an employee, if you're in my in the AUP or not, doesn't matter. Anybody who is interested in these issues um, to come and join with us. And if you don't mind, I will be sending emails with some up upcoming meetings if you would like to get involved. Because if we're going to have things like child care on campus, it's going to be a fight. And it might not be, you know, an ugly fight. I think everyone wants to be able to do that. Um, but it's a matter of spending priorities. And um, our union contract is coming up in a couple of years. It would be nice to um, look at the alternatives at this that we're going to be discussing today and um, trying to make that a possibility, but it's going to require all of us pulling for, for these types of things. Um, so I will be in touch. I will be reaching out for your assistance and help. And thank you all for being here. And uh, make sure you uh, have a cookie or uh, some grapes or something. Okay. Right. Supplied by Russell Street Deli. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. And I also want to give a very warm thank you to all of our uh, speakers here for coming. I'm really excited about you all being here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Laura Lee Kishley. I'm a faculty member and also an associate dean in the College of Fine Performing Communication Arts. And I chair the Provost Daycare Implementation Committee, which started a couple of years ago based on work that had been done the prior year, surveying students, faculty, and staff about child care needs. Um, if anybody's been here at Wayne State a long time, you've probably heard this refrain a few times. You get surveyed and then you get surveyed and then you get surveyed and then. Well, our provost didn't want the and then. So that's why our committee was set up and we've been working over the last couple of years to explore and see the ways that the university can engage and create and support a variety of child care options. Um, and so we're going to give you an update on some of that. I gave you a handouts, um, just some of the resources we're thinking about. We've presented a plan, um, I've sent recommendations to the provost with some timelines, so hopefully we'll be expanding it even more. Uh, the, the initial thing we have done is partnered with uh, Rainbow Child Care Center, which is now under kinder care, so I'm happy to have Lisa here to talk a little bit about Rainbow, um, and we have reserved spots in their center for our Wayne State students, faculty, and staff. Um, the discount is on the registration fee, uh, not on the tuition. Um, working with the university about how that might be a good idea and how we might go about resourcing that. Um, but we also wanted to introduce you and have you uh, know what we already have on campus. So that's why Anna Miller is here. Uh, and Anna has an incredibly long list of names. Um, She's with the College of Education. She's also, I'm going to make sure I get this right, because I want to get everybody's right. She's the Executive Director for the College of Education, Merrill Palmer Skillman Institute, Early Childhood Centers. We have two on campus. 
that are all five-star rated. Um, and she's also the director of the Woodward Corridor Early Childhood Center. So she's going to talk to us about that. I'm also happy that Jenny McAlpine is here. As we were doing our work, started looking to our sister institutions. And University of Michigan, from my point of view, has done an awful lot to facilitate and support families and child care specifically. And so when we had this opportunity, I asked Jenny if she would come and share with us some of the things that the University of Michigan is doing. You've got some handouts. Jenny is the Senior Director of Work-Life Programs at the University of Michigan. And I also mentioned Lisa, who's the Executive Director for Rainbow, soon to be Kinder Care, or you're going to explain that all yeah. to us, right? <laughs> and then I'm really excited to have Krista McClure here. Krista is the owner of the Detroit Parent Collective which is a really interesting way of approaching some of the issues of child care, and she's going to share with us what some of her experiences are. So the way we'd like to proceed is we're going to have each of the people speak a little bit. If, if you have questions of clarification, we'll take them at that time. But I'd like to get through all four, and then we can engage in a lot of questions, discussion, and so forth. Does that work? Okay, cool. All right, so I'd like to start off with Jenny McAlpine. Jenny, oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Lori and Michelle. Can you guys see the back? Can you hear me? No. No. He is going now. <laughs> okay, I can get louder. Do you want I come from a family with three here? girls, so we're usually very loud. Um, do you want me to stand up? I'll yeah, stand up. that's yeah. probably yeah. a right. better idea, Jenny. And you can so, come out here if you want. Let me start again. Uh, just thanking Laura Lee and Michelle for inviting me. We had some good conversations on the phone. Can you hear me now? Okay. And thank you to my co-panelists. It's really nice to meet all of you. And thank you for coming and, and exploring this. So uh, my position at the university is called uh, the Director of Work-Life Programs in, a, in our campus. That includes our Work-Life Resource Center. We have a handout about our services there. And it includes three early childhood programs. Each serves about 150 children. And those came about in a very um, uh, huge child care initiative that was started after we had some surveys of students and faculty that showed a very, very, very clear need, especially for infant care. We had five centers on campus at that time, and they were all relatively small except for our Health System Children's Center, which was outsourced to a third party. Um, the other four centers were basically preschool classrooms, and they, they, each center probably had three to six classrooms. Um, so uh, the economics of early childhood education are very, very tight, as I'm sure Lisa and Anna can tell you. Um, so 90% or more of our costs are tied up in staffing, and yet still our teachers don't make enough money uh, for the incredible work that they do. Um, so the university uh, hired me to try to shepherd this project through to expand infant and toddler care to improve the facilities where our programs were held and to increase and streamline administration because all of these five centers reported up to different uh, entities so one reported to student affairs and the other reported to the grad school and the other reported to the health system uh, and the health system wasn't even in our university at that time so uh, after the surveys went to the provost and the president, Mary Sue Coleman was president at that time, she allocated funds for an initiative to look at all these issues and to do those things. And I'm sure Wayne State is a lot like Michigan in terms of having input from all constituents. And certainly in changes with your child's care, that's a hugely, hugely important near to, near to your heart issue. So we had many different task forces of parents, researchers, teachers, directors, um, administrators from the different entities. We pulled all of our programs under human resources and we now report up through our uh, CFO to the president. We expanded all the centers, we built uh, one new building and renovated the others. Um, we took over Pfizer's building, Pfizer left in kind of the midst of this, of our efforts. And I had about 30 people call me within an hour saying, they have a children's center, let's try to get it. And we did. We managed to get it. We rented it from them for a while, and then the university bought that whole campus. So um, today we have about 60 babies and about 100 toddlers, spaces. There's more children than that because some are part-time. And almost 400 preschoolers. So when I talk about the budget, if you know, um, for you to know, 
Infant and toddler care is hugely expensive if you do it properly, which means that each baby has a lot of attention and people that know what they're doing. So we try to keep our infant ratios at the max of one to three. Licensing requires one to four. We often have one to two. So I'll have an infant room with six babies and two teachers full time. And we'll also have students in there, we'll have other people <coughs> that can support. I want my teachers to have time out of the classroom so that they can hear themselves think. So our staffing is pretty, um, is considered uh, more than what you would expect in a lot of programs, but that's very expensive. Um, so our fees are expensive. For many years, the university wanted us to be self-funding, and they gave us a small amount of money because we were teaching undergraduate classes and hosting student teachers and researchers. <laughs> Um, they just increased that in the last couple of months because we were experiencing a huge amount of turnover given the economy right now. Losing a lot of teachers to public schools. Public schools are really looking for teachers right now. Um, and so instead of comparing us to other early childhood programs, we compared ourselves to public schools. And that helped us to really raise our teacher salaries recently. Um, so I've always been very grateful for the university's investment in early childhood education, and it is expensive. So there's really no way to do this inexpensively. Whether you contract it out or whether you have it in-house, it still is going to be a significant expense. Most universities um, that have early childhood programs, a great many of them, contract out the services, but they provide the building, the utilities, a lot of the um, administrative support like grounds maintenance, electricity, maybe computers, maybe payroll. So there's a significant even in-kind contribution that universities have to make. So as you go forward and make your plans, I'm happy to share, you know, anything that, any budgets or any strategies that we use to try to make that case um, to our leadership. Because if you go to leadership with a case for a change, it has to be very, very tight you have to have a lot of the answers yourself, and you have to be very careful about what you ask for because you're not going to be able to go and ask for it again probably in the next 10 years. Uh, once they make an investment, they're going to hold on to that for a while, and you're going to go lower on the list. So um, our programs are great. I think since they're homegrown and, and um, administered internally, we were able to honor the histories of those programs through the curriculum, so they're all, they're all a little bit different. My North Campus Center uses a Reggio-inspired curriculum. Reggio Emilia is a kind of early childhood curriculum. My Towsley Center uses what's called the project approach. And my Health System Center uses what's called the creative curriculum. It's kind of an eclectic mix of things. But that allows for our parents to have a lot of choice between how each program kind of feels for them. So that's the Children's Center, and then the Work-Life Resource Center, there's another handout here about our supports for people throughout the lifespan. And the mission of this office that I oversee is really to support our faculty, <coughs> staff, and students with trying to make it all work together. So that is not bound by whether you have children or not. Everybody needs help managing their schedules, seeing if they can get more flexibility in their work, um, taking care of their parents, taking care of adult uh, children that need care still because of a special need. So you can see from this laundry list here that we have quite a few different programs going on. And I know that one Laurel Lee wanted me to talk real quickly about was the Campus Homes Network. So that is a group of people that we have worked with that are licensed family and group child care homes in the community um, that are just affiliated with us. And we provide a lot of training equipment, grants, and a sense of community, uh, and they, in return, save some spaces for us in their programs. So that's been a nice addition, too. And Jenny, that's one of the places where you found more infant care spots, right? Yes, it is. In fact, those homes care for about 90 children from U of M, but they provide a good 40 <coughs> more baby spaces for us. Mm -hmm. So it's very cost-effective that way. Any questions? We're going to come back to. All right. Now we're going to hear from Anna Miller, okay. talking about Wayne State's current centers. Oh, oh sorry. It, it's really small. <laughs> 
the hookup to this makes everything so small. And at our age, that's hard. <laughs> I'm Anna Miller. I'm a lecturer in the College of Education in Early Childhood Education, and I've been here to the point now so many years I even hate to admit it. I've been here uh, since the mid-80s and involved in um, the College of Ed Early Childhood Center, and then the last 10 years I've been the executive director of both that center and the Merrill Palmer Skillman Institute Early Childhood Center, which is just under another unit here at the university, but I've aligned the two programs. Uh, I'm also the chair of the Wayne State University uh, Early Childhood Consortium, and I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, and how that's set up. So we do have these two centers uh, on campus, um, and the College of Ed Center has two classrooms serving 32 to 36 children and as Jenny said the number varies because um, I'll talk about the funding sources in a minute but the tuition slots parents have options of five days a week two days a week or three days a week so um, so the that the amount varies the Merrill Palmer Center is uh, and the College of Ed Center is located in the University Tower apartment building, not the dorm, the uh, one on Cass, just down the street from the Cass Cafe. And the Merrill Palmer Institute uh, serves 50 to 58 children, and it's in the Nat building on East Ferry. So one's on like the southwest end corner of campus, and the other one is on the northeast corner of campus. Uh, and we serve children two and a half to five years of age. The classrooms are mixed age groups, so within a classroom we have children that are two, three, four, and some now are, of course, turning five. Uh, we have some options for before and after school care, so we can, you can extend the day a little bit. And we operate the academic year, so we're uh, in operation from September through May. Um, the College of Ed Center was uh, established in 1957 as the teaching preparation site for the College of Education. And um, we are really two, these two centers are uh, some of the few centers, college labs, uh, schools that are located in urban settings. So that's unique about our, uh, our two programs. Um, the College of Ed Center is a demonstration site for best practices. All of the early child, elementary ed students who are getting their early childhood endorsement, meaning they're specializing in children birth to eight, have to do two semesters of student teaching, one at the preschool level and one at the elementary level, and they go to the College of Ed Early Childhood Center for their preschool student teaching. Um, and um, we also have um, an intro ed class in the College of Ed where students have to do 40 hours of service learning and some of them choose to come to one of the two early childhood centers to do that 40 hours of service learning. Uh, the Merrill Palmer Center was established in 1922 and it has had a long history and has been nationally recognized for its research on family and child development. Uh, it was the second nursery school opened in the nation. So that's, it has a long, rich history. Um, and it is also a demonstration site. I'm proud to say that both centers are nationally accredited. Both of them are NAEYC accredited. Uh, it's a long... Uh, arduous process. Uh, the College of Ed Center is in its third five-year cycle and the Merrill Palmer Center is in its second five-year cycle and we are only um, 
two of only five in the city of Detroit who are NAEYC accredited. Um, the, Michigan has a quality rating and improvement system called the QRIS, and uh, you uh, go through their process and you're awarded a star rating of zero stars, meaning you haven't gone through the process, to five stars, which is the highest, meaning of highest quality. And we are two of only seven in the city of Detroit who have a five-star rating. And just to give you perspective, there's 296 licensed child care centers in the city of Detroit. So we have really high-quality programs. Our curriculum is the project approach, which is one of the ones that Jenny mentioned that uh, their centers use. Our teachers, okay, our teachers are, um, our teachers are, and this is our choice because again, we believe in uh, high quality, and so all of our lead teachers are elementary certified with an early childhood endorsement, which is way beyond what a lot of child care centers require for lead teachers. And all of our assistant teachers either have their CDA, Child Development Associates, or an associate's degree in child development or early childhood education, which again is a little bit higher than uh, most, uh, most centers require. And we also have uh, student assistants from the university who work for us. Um, I already talked about the fact that we do do um, uh, the service learning. Uh, it, they also uh, serve as field sites for <laughs> students from other departments throughout the university. So speech and language comes and does speech and language screening with our children so that the students get practice in doing that and providing you know, uh, feedback afterwards. We've had occupational therapy. Uh, psychology, um, and um, again, uh, some classes within the university use the sites as observation sites for assignments. So again, you can see that we serve many purposes. So uh, we believe in community engagement. That is a big um, part of our mission here at Wayne State, and in particular, we use the centers as demonstration sites, so uh, center directors, teachers from other centers might come and do observations or might say, hey, I need support with this, and uh, they, they would come to the centers and we would support them. And then I will talk about the consortium in a minute. And also, from time to time, people from different departments use the centers to do research. One of the ones that I've got listed here that was really interested, interesting was uh, Dr. Paul Kilgore um, was doing, he was testing hand screening. They were screening the hands of children. He's done this with older children and adults and he was seeing if it would work with preschoolers. And it can tell, um, and this is like a real basic, <laughs> Uh, explanation. It could tell what kind of immunizations they've had, and he was using this technology in uh, communities um, in, um, in other parts of the world where there what might not be records of immunizations and stuff. So that was kind of really interesting. So we are used in that way. Our funding, once upon a long time ago, used to be all from the university. But as Jenny so eloquently uh, laid it out, it is expensive, and um, over the years, we've had to uh, figure out how to pull together funding to keep operating the centers. And so we have the Michigan Department of Education Great Start Readiness Grant, the GSRP grant, which is the state-funded preschool program for four-year-olds, so families who qualify uh, for, um, and meet the grant eligibility requirements. They're four-year-old. This is strictly for four-year-olds. The state has nothing for three-year-olds. Uh, can then have a Monday through Thursday program, 8.30 to 3.30 for free. Uh, and we have 40 school day slots in the GSRP program um, between the two centers. 
And then I also have a U.S. Department of Ed grant, Child Care Access Means Parents in School, it's C campus. This is for undergraduate Pell Grant eligible students who are taking a minimum of six credit hours a semester and have a minimum of a 2.0 GPA. Uh, if they meet those requirements, then they can get free child care. Um, 8.30 to 4 is that program so that they can pursue their studies here at the university. So that's how the grant supports them. And then I do some things with them as um, to support them as students at the university. We have 10 slots under that grant, um, which leaves us about 30 slots for tuition paying families who don't meet either of those requirements. So at the College of Ed Center, you can see our capacity. It's only two classrooms. Um, we have 24 GSRP slots, two C campus slots, and six um, full-time equivalency tuition slots. And those are the ones that some families might take two days, three days, five days. So it might be more than six children that we serve. Each classroom at each site serves 16 children. Um, we cap it at 16. <clears throat> and at the Merrill Palmer Center, there are three classrooms. There are 16 GSRP, eight C campus and 24 tuition slots. So you can see our capacity is a lot smaller than you know, When you were ro rolling out those numbers, I thought, wow, 400 preschoolers, and, and we've got about what, 80, 80, 85 here. Um, another initiative that um, I've been a part of here on campus um, and was supported through grants was the uh, Early Childhood Consortium. It was started about seven years ago. Um, and we knew that center directors really do it all, right? Mm -hmm. If you live the life of a center director, it would be nice if you could be the pedagogical leader. It would be nice if you could focus on the business aspect, because a lot of them don't have business managers. Uh, but a lot of times you go in thinking you're going to take care of this and you're preparing lunch because your food prep person is out sick or you're in the toddler room because one of the teachers is out. So center directors have this unique responsibility and yet all these tugs on them. Uh, and there's a lot of professional development opportunities out there for the staff that works in early childhood centers, the teachers, the assistant teacher, the child care aides. Very little support for the center directors in terms of professional development. So that's how we started this with the child care centers located in the downtown, midtown, and north end neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, also on the consortium are faculty from the College of Education and from the Merrill Palmer Center <coughs> Institute. And uh, an interesting phenomenon that's happened, we wanted to include community partners in this endeavor, and community partners are almost crawling out of the woodwork to be a part of this. And so we support uh, all of these people in a variety of ways. The goals are to provide professional development, uh, to, to support an implementation of best practices, um, to expand and improve parent engagement and education programs, so we have a component of that, and to build collaborative relationships among consortium members. Um, the activities at no cost to families are monthly meetings. Um, we put on an annual conference that we just had December 1st, okay, uh, and um, we have an annual uh, PD for just center directors and community partners. We have an on-site coaching component, professional development, and a parent engagement component. And in our, um, I'm also a member of the daycare implementation committee, and one of the things that we've been talking about is how do we tap into the consortium members to support child care um, here on campus. So that's it. Anybody have any clarifying questions for that? If not, we'll hear from Lisa, and I know I have to pull something up for okay. you, too. <clears throat>
My name is Lisa, and I am the Education Director for Rainbow Child Care Center. And I also want to introduce Amy. She is our Site Director at our Detroit campus that we are opening soon. So Amy is here to answer any questions that I cannot about her specific school. Um, but while they're working on pulling up uh, my display, um, there are a couple things I want to share with you about our program. So first of all, as they mentioned earlier, we were recently acquired by Kinder Care Education. So we are going through the transition, but our school will still open under the name of Rainbow Child Care Center, and it's located on uh, Mac and Brush. So we have all of our inspections complete, and we're just waiting on the final word from the state to be able to open our doors. So we're hoping that should be any time now. So I think our last inspection that we passed was in November. So um, there are a couple additional hurdles we have to jump through um, when opening a program in the city. So um, there has been some delays that we didn't anticipate along the way, but we're very excited to open. We will service children from ages 6 weeks to 12 years old, and we will also provide before and after school care and care for school-age children during the summer. So right now we do have openings that are, we have uh, spots available but limited. Um, our infant program is currently full, um, but we do have some spaces in other programs. So if you were interested in enrolling in our building, um, we're going to have Amy available to talk to you. I also have some flyers if you're interested. Um, in our program, um, yeah, that's okay. You can scoot up a little bit. So in our program, uh, we uh, Rainbow Child Care Center utilizes the creative curriculum, which they explained to you is also a curriculum-based program for learning for young children. With the acquisition to kinder care, we will be transitioning over to Early Foundations, which is a curriculum that was developed in-house by kinder care education. So as we've been going through the transition, I've had the pleasure to help with the transition team, and I created what we are calling a crosswalk of education, so that we can explain to our teachers and families the difference between Early Foundations as well as the difference between um, the creative curriculum. So there are a lot of similarities within the programs. And the, the most important thing to remember is that both programs provide high quality care and education for children utilizing best practice standards that are set forth by NACI, which Anna also already mentioned, and is focused on a hands-on approach to learning for children. So we really want them to get messy, engage in learning experiences, and have the opportunity to have a say in their learning environment. We do provide flexible schedules for our older children. Um, we don't have as much flexibility for our infant and toddler programs because of the demand, um, but we do have limited enrollment available in the toddler program. We also have an open door policy, which means you are welcome to come into the school at any time, and we encourage parents to be a part of their child's educational learning experience. We use an app called Rainbow Connect, and the reason why I introduce this to you is because we know that parents want to be engaged in their child's learning process, and it's very important that you have the opportunity to be able to experience the day in the life of your child. So we utilize an app that allows our teachers to uh, digitally update parents on their child's day. For our infant parents, they want to know when their child was fed, when their diaper changes were, and things of that nature. Um, so we make sure that through the app they can see those opportunities. Um, we also can take pictures of the children's learning experiences and then add information about what the child learned throughout the day. This has been a great uh, improvement to our educational offerings and it's been in service for just about a year now. Um, and a lot of other child care companies and programs are starting to introduce similar uh, programs if they don't already have it. So as I mentioned, we really want to focus on having parents as partners. So you're welcome to come into the school at any time. You can volunteer. You can come read a story to the class. You can get messy in the sensory table with us. Um, so we believe in an all-inclusive environment. As Anna mentioned, we also will pursue NACI accreditation which is an accrediting body that has very rigorous standards. That means that you go above and beyond the, the state licensing standards. So the school has to be in operation for one year before they can actually submit. So we will open our doors in the process of self-assessment, getting ourselves ready to submit when we are available to. And then uh, we will also uh, apply for the QRAS system, which Anna also explained a little bit about as well. And so it is important for us to provide high quality care and education as well. So here's a few pictures of our location, of our school. It's beautiful. I actually had the opportunity to stop by um, and tour the school before I came here, and it is just 
it is beautiful and it's ready for children. So we are very excited to open our doors. Um, Amy's been anxiously waiting since <laughs> August, at least to say the minimum. Um, so we have our teachers ready to go. We have wait lists in some of our classrooms. We're just waiting on the approval from the state. So we're excited to be able to join, um, to come back to Detroit. Rainbow has had child care centers before in Detroit, so we're excited about this opportunity, and we look forward to partnering with Wayne State. One thing to note is that Wayne State has a partnership with the center so that we reserved eight um, infant slots and 32 of the other slots, and the eight are all gone now, it sounds like. Um, we took half of their infant slots and we put that to us. Um, and we, uh, the registration, you usually have to do a registration fee for any center you go to. They match the ones that we have for our two centers, which is lower than what they typically do. But we are looking at trying to come up with some other ways to come. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Kristen McClure, uh, Detroit Parent Collective. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm going to stand because I've been like shaking the entire time sitting. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because I, um, I'm in, I have a leaf on my scarf, that's why. Um, <laughs> I'm honored to have the, op like the opportunity to be able to sit on a panel um, with highly educated individuals who've been in the early childhood space and sector for a really long time, whereas I've not. Um, I worked uh, kind of on the policy level in Detroit uh, in education, um, <clears throat> and so in that space I did a lot of listening with the intent of listening to what parents are asking for. Meanwhile, I was like the youngest person at the table, as I still presently am. Um, and then I ended up shifting and working in development with the city of Detroit. And so where my business is located, Detroit Parent Collective is in, on Six Mile, um, across the street from Marigold College, in a neighborhood. And that was really intentional for me. Um, I did not grow up in the city, I grew up in the suburbs, but whenever I found myself in the city, I was planted at Marigold College. And so that was what I knew Detroit to be, not downtown. I never went to a Red Wings game in my life or a Tigers game. I did not know that space. Um, so kind of, uh, right, in working with the city and then reflecting on, I guess, the groundwork of what made me passionate about what I'm doing, um, when I worked at the policy level, I knew that there needed to be quality in a space for children for all, despite the two biggest barriers and divides, which is race and social economic class. So <clears throat> I ended up launching and spearheading between I think September 1, which is my official date that I uh, quit from working with the city of Detroit, and I left a marvelous uh, job that was paying me really great money uh, to opening a small business that I had no idea what I was doing, and I laugh to this day with my friends who came and celebrated me on the ribbon cutting day, because now that I look back, you know, on Facebook, it's like, look back at your memories. And I like looked back at last year, and I'm like, why did you guys let me open the doors? <laughs> it's a, it was a hot mess. Um, so. The model is co-working, which if some of you are familiar with or not familiar with, it's a space for you to pay a monthly membership like a gym, you have a laptop, you have Wi-Fi, coffee, tea. Um, but we added on childcare. And we first started off with just like a co-op preschool. When we opened the doors, it was fall of 2017. And so we wanted to just kind of test and pilot the model. Uh, the Skillman Foundation, even though we're a small business, they gave us a discretionary grant dollar to be able to just kind of test the model. And we did, and those founding members, um, with the exception of two, are still with us to this day. So we started a, a co-op preschool model, and in that co-op preschool model, as maybe some of you are, aren't familiar with the co-op model, really is pulling in a lot of parents, a lot of parent engagement involved in the classroom. Uh, and it worked well for us. Uh, at the time, who led the classroom um, uh, is a woman, uh, Dr. Jan Hoagie, who actually had also worked at Marigold College before they ended up closing the undergrad program, and so it just kind of worked out in a way where she ended up stepping into the classroom, and so this individual with a PhD was working with early childhood children uh, and had never had any experience in that space before. But it worked because it was the idea of being able to um, kind of support the family's needs, but then we ended up adopting uh, the model of like a nature-based learning center. So we adopted Montessori, we adopted Waldorf, and we adopted Reggio into this co-op model. Uh, and the reason being for that for me was because I wanted to be able to have, again, quality for all children despite the two things, race and self-economic status or class. Um, so in our space when you walk in, uh, you're usually greeted by coffee, 
the smell and fragrance of coffee or something that's baking in the oven. Um, because we do make our meals for our children and, it, and it's something that like, we work with the collective of families to do. And it's a vegetarian meal. Um, and then uh, you will see greenery, a lot of plants, right, to offer and pull in oxygen. We have no plastics. I want all wood. The aesthetics to me, my, my children attend Cranbrook, and I want the same quality of Cranbrook that I see to have the same quality for children in Detroit. And I will say that in my experiences uh, in education when I was in that space, there was a lot of idea, uh, kind of like these ideas of what children should have in Detroit <clears throat> for Detroit children. Because Detroit children are a little bit different than my own children, right? Uh, and for me, I wanted to have the same quality that I see for my kids. So again, looking back on that year one, shame on me because that was not the quality of what I would have wanted to see for my children. But now when I walk into this space, I mean, my daughter, who's at 10 in Cranbrook, is like, I want to go with you to work because of what that space looks like and feels like. Um, and I don't know what to do about her. Um, so we had the co-op preschool, and then we ended up expanding and having infant toddler care because we did. We had a demand for families who had young children. Infant child care in the city of Detroit has tremendous wait lists, which at least I know you know of, um, and just high demand. Um, and so uh, at that time, we did not offer it just because of the staffing. It was myself who volunteered. To this day, I still volunteer. And then um, the uh, preschool teacher. Um, by the time January of 2018 arrived, we ended up expanding and offering then an infant and toddler care uh, space, um, which again followed kind of the same um, learning philosophy, and that's the Waldorf, the Reggio, and the um, Montessori. So again, the natural woods, a lot of colors and painting and light, and a lot of like textures. We have that beautiful campus of Mirror Grove that we're able to access, and so our children daily are bringing back bark, soil, pebbles, and sticks. And it's amazing. They spend quite a bit of time outside, and Mayor has opened their doors to offer us to be able to use that space. Um, we presently uh, have a wait list in our infant and toddler program. Um, and within our preschool program, we just actually returned to Detroit um, from Madison Heights. We had some water issues with our building. Had to get that fixed, um, get some HEPA testing to make sure that there were no molds. We moved back. We opened our doors on the 7th. And we only have four slots available left in our preschool program now. We um, are not licensed and actually under IFF, which is a large um, early childhood, uh, I guess, consulting firm that they usually help give loans to early childhood programs. Uh, they also offer trainings uh, and they also give out loans to some schools. Um, <clears throat> they, under their guidance, have given some feedback to us around um, knocking on the wall and bringing in exterior light. Um, maybe having some like uh, air circulation, so we added some ceiling fans, and so we really like worked with them on kind of creating this beautiful space. And the one thing that I was really uh, concerned with is that the members that we're pulling, we have some who come from as far as Gross Point Park, as far north as Franklin, Michigan, um, you know, different parts of Detroit. And the biggest concern that I have is that in trying to be able to offer an affordable co-op model, <clears throat> I wanted to be able to make sure that we were tapping into the community in which we were residing. The intent of being in that space was because I knew what was coming ahead as far as development, because I worked in development. Gentrification, new Detroit, whatever term you want to use, in any state, if there's anyone here in business, there's always going to be highs and lows in economic, wherever you are, in any urban community. Um, and the, but it was critical to me to be able to have a space that actually would represent the folks from in the community and those who are new and welcoming to the community with the intent that we are here to remove the divide, um, and the biggest divide, again, our social economic status and race. Um, and we've been able to do that. We have monthly collective meetings, uh, and in the collective meetings today, I'm very invigorated because we actually were able to kind of make a collective decision on moving, something very small, right? We were only open four days a week, Monday through Thursday, and the members were like, let's go to five days. So effective February, we're going to go to five days. Um, we also ended up kind of adopting this really awesome model. Uh, we have a letter through the state of Michigan because we're not a licensed daycare facility. Parents are required to stay on site. And if it's not a parent or guardian, um, maybe it's a nanny, babysitter, grandparent, whatever. Um, but we ended up deciding to adopt a new model, and that would be that <clears throat> we now know each other and we trust each other well enough that if I need to be gone for the day, I'm going to sign off my parental consent to this parent to act as the caregiver for the day. And that's a huge move for a lot of our families because a lot of them need to work off-site. A lot of the folks I have are film directors, um, 
who have a, you know, an adjunct professor, uh, artist, I don't know, a nurse who loves <coughs> babies, but they needed to be able to kind of have like that space, that village that they could rely on each other. And I'm just blown away because I think that that's what we've created. And I think that if there were more folks who worked <coughs> in the space of early childhood, who really listened to what families were saying, yes, I think it costs tremendous amounts to provide for care for children. And I believe that we're offering quality care even though we're not a licensed child care program. Um, but it takes a village, it takes a collective of people to be able to let that work. And I think we're doing it. We get um, a, lot of, a lot of folks who are interested in the model. Okay, so we just heard about a range of 